I thought I was clear. <laughs> okay. Okay, so but let's, let's see if I manage five, five minutes. I will try hard because I also want a coffee. <laughs> so uh, this is about a publication I wrote last year. It was published here in Science of Total Environment. And I want just to quickly to go through these few points. Uh, let's skip this. So when you know about, so what we know about uranium resources is basically every time you find this so-called red book from the EIR, comes out every two years and it makes a press declaration. It's basically every two years is the same thing. The numbers change dramatically in the different resource categories, so-called, but the press declaration is basically always the same. It's a project that goes from last one, 375 gigawatt to something like between 540 to 746 gigawatt within the next 25 years. And if you want to succeed, then you need to, the projected demand for uranium rises from 64,000 tons uh, to something between 100,000 tons to uh, 140,000 tons by 2035. Now then they always say, well actually, this will never work. Uh, even so the resources are somewhere, we don't know exactly where, but meeting projected demand will require timely investments in uranium production facilities. This is because of the long lead times, typically in the order of 10 years or more in most producing countries. Okay, so let's see what the reality is. And so I, well, I wrote 10 minutes, but I maybe try to, <laughs> to speak a little bit faster. So what do we really know? Unidentified uranium resources, how reliable they are, existing mines and depletion profiles, and then what is the consequences of it. So let's have a look. 2011 pre-Fukushima situation, world demand was about 68,000 tons of uranium. Western Europe, 21,000 tons. USA, 19,000 tons. And Japan plus Korea, 10,000 tons. If you look, where do they get these countries of uranium from? It's all these countries are without significant uranium mines. Today's primary mining supply situation, 2010 was 54,000 tons. Uh, the rest came from secondary supplies, nuclear for example, nuclear weapons. 85% from only six countries, 75% from 20 large mines, and <coughs> this 72% controlled by only six mining companies. So this is actually very easy. There are about 30 mines to consider in an analysis, so even a physicist can do this, and I don't have to go through 3,000 oil fields or more. All right, so doing this, you can take the lessons from past uranium mining. Uh, and it's very interesting to start with countries where resources are depleted. So I show you here the uranium mining in Western Europe. <coughs> this you see a nice interesting profile. Basically uranium mining stopped around the year 2000. You have here France, Czech Republic, and East Germany. Now you can go for United States, South Africa, here is South Africa. Basically, it's now a tiny little fraction of what it used to be, and similar for the United States. And <coughs> now it's very, very little concern in contribution in comparison to actual needs of the 100 or so nuclear power plants. So the interesting thing is when you look at it, there's a database from the AR. <coughs> Uh, you can see, for example, here how large the demand in these Western Europe countries is. Then peak production was in, actually for all of Western Europe in 1976. And, but what is more interesting, perhaps, is the initial resource estimates, which you find in this database. And you get kilotons here for different countries. In total, 810,000 kilotons was estimated by this database with some uncertainties. Now, what was extracted when it was stopped, and it was only half of it. So <clears throat> this is a particular interesting number. And actually, you find a similar thing for many other countries where uranium mines have been depleted. <coughs> and actually, there are quite a lot of regions. It's in regions in Canada, Ontario, Elliott Lake, New Mexico, Utah, Germany, Czech Republic, France, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, Gabon, 
and so on and so on. So I find a lot of areas where actually uranium mining was stopped because nothing was left. So I think this demonstrates clearly that <coughs> actually interesting uranium deposits are limited and it's really a finite resource like all other sources as well. And <coughs> mining of individual deposits eventually must stop and so in uranium rich regions and countries. So the second message is mining techniques actually only recover 50 to 70 percent of the original resource estimate <coughs> and remains from uranium mines actually a heavy burden for future generations. Um, so out of all this I looked into existing past mines which are documented some of them are actually pretty well documented. This is in Australia and in Canada. And you find from the database, from the IAR, what's the original estimate of kilotons in these different deposits were. For example, rabbit-like, Collins, A, B, C, and so on in, the, in Canada and similar for, for this here below. And you find these original estimates. And then you can see how much was extracted when these mines were stopped. And again, you find similar numbers. There <coughs> are actually somewhat less than originally estimated. Now, then you see another interesting thing. You get a certain plateau value, which was uh, extracted every year uh, on a, based on more geological uh, accurate estimates. And then actually you can see, by well, how is this plateau value determined? And a very simple-minded <coughs> idea is, well, let's take the whole cost of the infrastructure and so on. What's the lifetime of the infrastructure? So you optimize the maximum according to the more precise determined resource you can extract. So let's take a 10-year plus minus something. And out of this, you can, so if the plateau value was 1.4, you get the 10-year hypothesis would tell you that you can extract something like 14,000 years. And actually, we can go for all these different mines which are stopped, and you find this fixed fits extremely well. Yeah, yes. So, idea total exploitable resource is a plateau value of any operating mines times 10 to plus minus two years, so 20% uncertainty from the slow startup and phase out periods. Now, you can test this with <coughs> these different finished uranium mines. Real extraction in these mines, 310,000 kilotons. My hypothesis result, 319 plus minus 24,000 kilotons. Wow, what a surprise. And so there are few abnormal deposits mines, which actually are close by in this case. So there was a very short mining period, much shorter than these 10 years. But this was to go from one mining to another. Olympic Dam is another exception because there is byproduct uranium actually and it's more for copper. So more data are needed in order to see if it's valid but if you take the data actually it, it works very well also. So out of this you can then make a forecast of all the existing and planned mines which <coughs> as you have seen take a long lead time before you can really establish a new mine and you have the 10 year lifetime and what you get is uh, <coughs> for the future there are only very few interesting deposits, large enough, which make it interesting for mining companies. And it follows easily that the planned mines cannot compensate for declines of operating mines. And as a result, obviously, you get a maximum world mining production. And this already peaks around the year 2015 with 58 plus minus 4 kilotons, followed by a decline, slow decline in 2020, 56 kilotons and then by 2030 41 kilotons. <laughs> so roughly two thirds of what is required by the current mines. Now you can do this also for the different countries, Kazakhstan, Canada and so on. And I've put all this together. You can see more carefully in the paper, which actually was as you can you do the so Yes. So here's the conclusion basically. This is the different mining in the most important uranium mining means. You add all this together and you get this follow-up. 
Now the demand, if you have constant nuclear demand capacity, could be this. If you have 1% phase out or 1% growth, and you see you hardly can fulfill these requirements. So, uh, as we are out of time, maybe I just put it like this, the conclusion, and we can have, I don't know if there's time for questions, or certainly. Well, we'll get coffee, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much.